Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to how to do a self evaluation of programs, services, and activities of a public entity. Abby Fraze here from the Ohio Department of Medicaid. I'll be moderating this session, and I am excited to support Ohio's commitment to inclusion. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. First, we invite you to submit questions or comments in the meeting chat. The presenter will do their best to address these at the end of the session. Second, this session is being recorded and may be posted online or made available for on-demand access. How to do a self-evaluation of program services and activities of a public entity will be presented by Robin Jones, Project Director and Principal Investigator, Great Lakes ADA Center. And now, please welcome Robin Jones. Greetings, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm happy to be with you today. Um, this is the second part of a session that I have been doing um, our topic um, today on this issue of self-evaluation for a uh, government entity such as the state of Ohio. As introduced, my name is Robin Jones. I am a 60 plus white female. I have short hair that is um, violet colored. I'm wearing black rimmed glasses. And today I have on a white jacket with a black and white um, scarf around my neck. So as we get started today, if you attended the first session that I did or did not attend it, I was talking about um, kind of the planning process. What do you need to think about before you start the process and get in all your ducks lined up in regards to your documentation? How are you going to document things? How are you going to go through um, the process? Who is going to be involved in that process and such? And so this next session is really talking more about drilling down into the how in regards to um, what you're actually going to do, uh, what questions are you going to ask, and, and how are you going to delve into this um, particular process. So let's go ahead um, and get started. So the self-evaluation, just to uh, remind everybody or to keep in, uh, reiterated it, and from what, if you weren't in the first session, uh, this may be a repeat for if you were. Um, under the ADA Title II regulations, it's a requirement to evaluate the services, policies, and practices and the effects of them that do not or may not meet the current requirements for Title II under the ADA. And why I say current requirements for Title II, there have been changes to the ADA since it was passed in 1990. The 90, there has been two sets of regulations released under the Americans with Disabilities Act state and local government. The first set of regulations were released in January of 1991, and those covered Title II, um, which is state and local governments. Then there was a new or a revised set of regulations that were issued in 2010 um, uh, that were um, issued by the US Department of Justice for Title II um, entities as well. And that was an update basically of the original regulations. So we have to really look at the fact that anything that we did or we thought that we did in compliance with the Title um, II regulations written in 1991, we need to revisit that even if we'd already done them, uh, any uh, our examination of our policies, practices, and procedures to make sure that we were up to date with everything for Title III, um, Title II uh, with the 2010 standards. An example, um, under the Title I, uh, the first set of standards from 1991, we did not have things defined. Uh, service standards, for example, were differently defined um, in the original 1991 ADA regulations. So if we had a service animal policy, we need to revisit that policy because under the revised policy um, in 2010, then the regulations is a service animal could only be a domestic dog, um, whereas previous to that, it could be other kinds of animals. Um, it also could be an exception of a miniature horse. So we needed to make sure that our policy reflected those kinds of things. In the 2010 ADA stand, uh, regulations, we also added a definition of an other power-driven mobility device. 
because in the uh, 1991 version of the regulations, they only talked about a traditional wheelchair. But as technology and other things have changed, people are using other kinds of devices. So people are using segways, they might be using a golf cart, they might be using um, a, a electric bike or something of that nature as their mobility device. So we are required to look at our policies, practices and procedures to make sure that we are able to accommodate that. In the um, 1991 regulations, all we talked about was um, traditional sign language um, and real-time captioning and things of that nature. In the revised, in the 2010 standards, we have a lot more specificity in regards to effective communication, specifically discussing the requirements for video relay services, um, uh, uh, video sign language interpreters and things of that nature, more clarification about who can and cannot um, provide sign language. For example, a lot more language about using family members or using children and such. So we need to go again, go back and look at our sign language um, regulations to make sure that we're up to date and we have our policies and our practices and our procedures in place if we're going to use video or remote interpreting or things of that nature. So there's a lot of those types of things that happened in the 2010 update to the regulations that even if I had done my self-evaluation back in 1991, 92, 92, 93, 94, I still would need to go back and make sure that I was current with the 2010 standards as they um, changed. So again, um, you know, the 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 idea behind the self-evaluation is that you look at what you, you look at what were your all your areas, your programs, what problems did you identify, and what modifications do you need to make. Um, make sure you provide opportunity for people to participate and submit comments from the public. And again, the state of uh, Ohio is greater than 50 employees, so you're required to keep your self-evaluation on uh, file. Again, these were the re regulations from 1991 because that's where the original requirement for this self-evaluation comes into play. But we have seen through the litigation occur, particularly through the um, what's called Project Civic Access, which is the program with the U.S. Department of Justice for enforcement of Title II of the ADA, where the U.S. Department of Justice has gone out and looked at over 250 entities randomly across the country um, uh, related to ADA compliance and examined them and entered into some kind of a settlement agreement with them to uh, remedy their um, the problems and issues that they have. Nobody wants to be subject to a project civic access um, examination or um, uh, complaint because that basically opens you up to every single thing that you do being examined by the U.S. Department of Justice and criticized and critiqued to see whether or not you're in compliance. You would much rather have done that in your own time frame and in your own um, methods and ways than to have it be dictated to you by an external entity. So that's just a, a word of caution and, and a, a reminder. Um, the Department of Justice, uh, because I, as I said, 1991 was when these were included. This, the requirement for self-evaluation was supposed to have been done uh, between 1991 and 1995. Um, the Department of Justice has taken a stance of the fact that um, if you've already done your self-evaluation um, under like Section 504 or if you did them in the um, under the 1991 regulations or requirements um, that, you know, you should continue to, uh, you, you don't have to redo them unless something has changed. But the reality is, and I spoke of this in the first session, was that I'm part of a research project where we did and looked at over 300 um, self-evaluations across the country, and we found less than a 5% compliance um, on those. So we know that a lot of people have not done that and have not done one that would meet um, and, and hold up probably if a complaint was filed um, and you really started to dig in and look at uh, what was done or not done. The components of a self-evaluation, again, are examining the program services and activities, evaluating how people with disabilities receive benefits and services and how they participate in your programs and services. And then the end result should be a set of priority-driven recommendations on how you're going to make your programs services um, accessible to people with disabilities. So how do we know whether we have been successful or we've uh, achieved success with this success? One, if we identify policies and procedures that need to be made um, uh, and changed to ensure accessibility, then you know that's good. That means that we identified a problem and we righted that problem. 
um, and that we report each one of them accurately and completely. Um, again, everybody has room for improvement. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Um, somebody can always do something better. You can always build a better mousetrap. So the purpose of the self-evaluation is not, again, to point fingers or to say, hey, you know, you weren't doing it right, you know, nah, 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 you know, I, I'm telling on you or, or whatever, but it's basically to spot your problems so that you can fix them. Um, you know, if, if you don't look at, you don't know what you don't know. And so if you don't take a critical look and you don't take a critical review of your processes and things of that nature, you're missing things that you, you know, um, may be subtle, but they're not so subtle when they um, happen to uh, impact somebody's access to a program or service. I always say it's never a problem till it's a problem. What you want to do in this situation, in this process, is you want to avoid having those problems that are not a problem, um, you know, arise uh, as much as possible. Everyone has room for improvement. So why is it important to do this and go through this process? One, it's the law. I can't remove that. I can't take that away. Um, you know, yes, uh, someone could say, well, you know, Congress has overstepped their boundaries in requiring us to do this or whatever. Um, but the reality, it's a law. It's been the law for 32 years now as we just celebrated the 32nd anniversary of the ADA. We need to do it because we have a growing aging population and we know tick tock, tick tock, every one of us is getting older. And as we age, we, be, we create and, and develop more limitations. So what we are able to do today, we may not be able to do tomorrow. So think about it, if nothing else, in the context of how would I want as my individual, how would I want me, how would I want my family member to be treated? How would they want them to have access to the programs that the state does or that I'm responsible for? If you're somebody who's here because you're responsible for a unit or a program or a department, how would I want them to be treated if they had a disability and they came and asked for services from our program? So think of it in that context. We want to make sure that people have equal access um, when they're seeking um, to use facilities and programs. And we also want to make sure our, our staff are empowered um, you know, and, and understand the importance of providing access uh, for people with disabilities, that, that people with disabilities are as viable a member of the public that they serve as people without disabilities. And unfortunately, so for so long, people with disabilities have been treated as second class citizens. Um, what if you don't do these? Well, of course, you have possibility of harsher mandates from litigation. Um, you have possibility of bad press. Nobody likes to be seen in the newspaper. Nobody likes to have it flashed across the screen that the state of Ohio refused to provide a, a individual with a disability, a sign language interpreter, so that they could get their driver's license. Um, you don't want to see that kind of, uh, you know, thing across the press. And I will tell you that the disability community has gotten very savvy and have gotten much more empowered. And they're using social media and other ways to convey when they feel that they've been discriminated against. And you don't want to be the subject of that TikTok video, um, you know, or that Instagram post or whatever else at me because of the problem that somebody had at one of your state agencies, one of your offices or whatever, and couldn't get access. I mentioned the Project Civic Access um, project the Department of Justice has. You don't want to be a subject of one of those um, investigations. You also don't want to be part of any settlement agreement or lawsuit. Um, it, it, having a self-evaluation in place um, is a significant evidence of good faith effort that we have seen and I have seen personally state and local governments be able to get cases dismissed or have minimal consequence from because they showed good faith effort. They showed that they'd done their due diligence, that they knew there were barriers, they were working on those barriers and such. So it's really important, um, you know, from that perspective at Wells. You, you also want to control your own fate. You want to control the process. You want to control your resources and your schedule. You do not want the courts or anyone else telling you what you have to do. And again, you know, we know that implementation can be delayed, um, but pending your, you know, pending the overall, you know, results of your evaluation. Um, but by the end of the evaluation, um, you know, you need to understand that some of your information may not be timely because it may have taken you a year to complete it. So understand that you have to be careful about decisions and stuff that you make along the way um, that, you know, you're, that you don't outdate yourself. So, you, you know, again, it's, it's a living, breathing process and needs to be constantly um, reviewed and looked at and kept up to date. If you already have a plan or some semblance of a plan or you think that your agency or department already has done some of this work, go back and look at it again. Do you have new programs? Do you have facilities that were modeled um, uh, or built new that you're using that were never part of your evaluation? 
Um, it, uh, what about your web-based presence? You know, you, you evaluated your website last year and it was accessible, but you know what happens? We add content to our websites every day and you could have a website. It's no different than a building. It has a structure to it and such. And every time you change it, every time you put the new picture on the wall, you know, a, a, that you've posted an image or you've uh, added another document or whatever else it might be, you have changed that website. So, it, I, you know, we need to make sure that we are consistently and, and regularly going back and, and making sure that our website is accessible. What about staffing changes? Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, had somebody who was responsible in our policies, practices and procedures for handling something that was part of our process. This person is who they you contacted, but that person retired two years ago and we've never updated that information. What's happening to that information? Is it going to an abyss? You know, um, we need to make sure that we're making things um, current and updated um, and that, that somebody's tracking it and um, knows and who and, and what is supposed to be happening. Have we privatized something that was previously done um, internally? We know that a lot of governmental entities opt to privatize some of their functions and activities because it's cheaper to do so over time. So you may have um, uh, uh, had something that you were doing internally and you're now doing it externally. Well, you're still responsible for its accessibility. You cannot contract away your obligations under the ADA. So if you're now privatized, you have to review and make sure that that private entity is doing and following all of the policies, practices, and procedures necessary for compliance under the ADA. And has anything changed? Um, uh, have the regulations changed? As I mentioned, with the 1991 versus the 2010 standards, looking at those things, but you also may have local things that have changed. So for example, you may have had um, something in, in the state of uh, Ohio, a state code. Um, you know, When you look at service animals, for example, you need to make sure that your policies, practices, and procedures are consistent with your service animal policies. One of the things that you have to look at is things like the ADA only recognizes, just as an example, domestic dogs, and they only recognize a trained service animal. But many of our states, including Ohio, have state um, laws around service animals that recognize service animals in training. Well, that means that, that, are, that are allowed to have certain areas of access and such. That means if I am only writing my service animal policy to uh, be in compliance with the ADA, I'm potentially out of compliance with my state law. So I need to make sure that my policy is following both state law and federal law um, to uh, to look at those. So I have to make sure that I, I'm melding those things and putting those things together. Um, and then again, you know, do I already have something? Am I following it? And is it current, you know, is a question to really ask yourself. Again, did we did you consider the new regulations? They were issued in 2010. They um, became effective March of 2011. And these are just some of the areas that were new. I discussed a few of them in the previous um, session, but uh, mobility devices, other power mobility devices, again, now recognizing segways, things of that nature, service animals, you know, restricted to a domestic dog and or the exception of a, um, uh, a horse, um, a miniature horse. Ticketing, um, uh, huge changes in ticketing in regards to um, how we issue tickets, and um, this could be ticketing for venues and things that are controlled and operated by the states, uh, the state itself. Effective communication has a lot of changes in it in regards to um, what constitutes effective communication, requirements for video remote interpreting, requirements for emergency uh, communications, um, requirements for um, uh, Individuals not who can uh, is not viewed as a qualified interpreter, like a family member or a child, et cetera. There's new requirements for, for res residential facilities that were not ever existed. So does the state of Ohio have residential facilities? Yes, you do. You have many state universities that you control and operate. Your state universities have their own obligations, but you have other residential facilities. You have some that are for individuals with intellectual disabilities. You have some that are run and operated for the, by the state for people with mental illness and such. You have uh, residential facilities in your correctional system for people who are in halfway um, uh, shelters or houses kinds of things. Now, again, you're going to say, well, well, but, you know, yeah, we, we kind of have those programs, but we contract that. We provide funds to community agencies to run those things. Hmm. You do, but it's still your program. Buck stops with you. So you, if even if you're providing dollars to an external entity, you still have to make sure that your practices and policies and their practices and policies are accessible. So you have to go down um, to that level. Um, again, your detention and correctional facilities, all of them, your minimum to your maximum security, uh, all of those are covered in the this area uh, that were not in the uh, 1991. Um, and then again, making sure everything is in compliance with the 2010 accessibility standards. The safe harbor I'm talking about is that if something was already accessible according to the 1991 standards, and I'm going to use, give you an example. 
In the 1991 standards, the ADA only required 50% of entrances to be accessible. So if I have a building and I only have two entrances, under the 1991 standards, I only had to have one of those entrances accessible. However, under the 2010 ADA standards, it was changed to 60% of all entrances have to be accessible. So if I'm looking at that same building that was already in compliance under the 1991 ADA standards, I'm good. I do not have to bring it up to the 2010 ADA standards. But if I design a new or build a new building, that new building has to be built according to the 2010 ADA standards. So I'm gonna have some buildings that were built and are in compliance under the 1991 ADA standards, and I'm gonna have some that are in compliance and were built under the 2010 ADA standards. That's part of my analysis, that's part of my data collection, is to understand when and what was done with my buildings and facilities and what standard was in effect to know whether I have a barrier or I don't have a barrier. And then hotel reservations, if any of your um, uh, your um, parks and recreation, your, your DNR, Department of Natural Resources facilities have any kind of um, hotels um, or lodging facilities, campsites, things of that nature, there's uh, um, requirements for reservations of those also that went into effect a little bit later. Um, they didn't go into effect until 2012. So starting off the process and the discussion, what exactly you've heard me many times, both in my previous session and this session, and uh, refer to that all your programs, services, and activities, when viewed in their entirety, must be readily accessible to and viewable by, usable by persons with disabilities. So the question is, what are programs, services, and activities? When I look at it broadly and define it, for the purposes of the self-evaluation, a program is a service or activity with a single purpose. It's an activity that's undertaken by a department agency or whatever that affords benefits, information, opportunities, or activities to one or more members of the public. So it's that drill down into what we do, that, that interface that we have with the public, that program that we have where we distribute something, that program that we have where we communicate something. All of those types of things are an activity or a service, they are gonna be viewed as a program. So some example, library services, meetings, hearings, special events, police protection is a program, publications that you put out are a program, counseling services, social services, the payment of any kind of fine or assessment, taxes, et cetera, is a service. Anything that also, again, is carried out by a contractor or grantee on behalf of the state is also counted in as part of your review of your programs, services, and activities. Here's an example. You have a public hearing. Assume certain facts. The meeting is held to conduct state business and communicate with residents of the state or the recipients of a specific program. They're all held in person. Some are held on a regular basis. Some are responsive to urgent situations like fiscal emergency situations, et cetera. You should include each type of meeting that is held or may be held in your assessment because what you have to look at in regards to accessibility will be different. If you have something that's held in an emergency situation, okay, with a last minute notice, what is your policy practice and procedure in regards to ultra effective communication? You might have a meeting that you've announced two weeks in advance and your policy practice and procedure for that is somebody has to notify you that they need to have a sign language interpreter seven days prior to the meeting um, in order for you to provide that particular accommodation. But if you're having a meeting in an emergency situation and you're calling it with 24 hours or 40 hours notice, that policy that you had previously for seven days notice no longer holds. How are you going to address that particular issue? And we would say to you that you you should have it be that you would automatically schedule that session to be sign language and, and real-time captions to be fully accessible because you did not give people and they didn't have by the nature of the event enough advance notice for you to, um, to, to let them know that they were coming for you to schedule that otherwise. So you should be prepared. But that's a policy issue. That's, that's a practice and a procedure issue for whoever's planning and doing those. And so when we're thinking about doing that kind of stuff, those should be part of that process. Those should be part of the standard operating procedures of what 
what needs to be done, but I need to make sure that I uh, document that. And that needs to be part of my analysis. So hopefully that's an example, gives you an idea about what I'm talking about when you start to drill down into what is a program or what is a service and how you would be evaluating that to ensure that you have the necessary um, policies, practices, and procedures in place to address each one of those. To just have a blanket policy of saying we will, um, our policy is we will provide sign language interpreters and real-time captioners upon request with a seven-day advance notice, that's not going to fit all of the circumstances and situations that I'm talking about. So again, what are we, how does our policy, how is it, um, can it be, how does it evolve to meet those particular circumstances and situations? And we need to have that as part of our assessment. So program access is that no individual um, with a disability shall, because of their facility being inaccessible to or unusable by individuals with disabilities, be excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of the public entity or being subject to discrimination by that public entity. So program access is a much is a really big issue of looking at the fact that I need to make sure that my facilities are not um, causing a barrier for somebody to access my program. So that's where I was talking earlier in the first session, If you, uh, but if you missed it, whereas maybe my answer to program access is, this building isn't accessible because this program is on the second floor and we don't have vertical access, we don't have an elevator. So we can, as a program access solution, being this is a program that it interacts with the public, the public has to come here, we're going to move that program from the second floor to the first floor. Or we're going to have a process in place by which when individuals who cannot get into up to the second floor can notify us in advance and we have an office area on the first floor and we will schedule their meeting or their, um, their interaction with us at a counter or a, a room or whatever on the first floor. That will be our response to that program access. Um, uh, requirements. So that's part of the evaluation is identifying where that barrier to that program is and then while not now what is our solution to that program? Is it going to be that we're moving the whole program to an accessible location or are we going to have a uh, modification of that program whereby we're going to provide notice to the public if you need vertical access, you need a physical accessibility to the office, this is how you'll go about getting it and we will provide it in this manner. So that would be part of how I would document and how I would look at that particular program. Then maybe five years down the line, we build a new building and we move everybody to that new building. And because we know that we cannot build a building now under the ADA that's not accessible, that program is going to be accessible, at least physically, because it's been removed to that new building. So now we go back and we modify that policy and practice and procedure and get rid of it because we no longer need it because everybody can be served in the same location. Again, program accessibility does not necessarily require physical changes. You can relocate to different parts of the building. You can deliver services at an alternative site. Again, I caution you, if you look at delivering an alternative sites, you look at geographic dispersion and um, disparity in relationship to that. When If I'm going to move it to a different site, I need to make sure that I'm providing people same access on public transportation routes, um, you know, uh, geographic dispersion in regards to the length or the distance of travel that somebody would have to. I would It would be discriminatory to say to a person with a disability, everybody without a disability, they have this service within five miles of their office. People with disabilities, we're limited in the number of sites that we have. You're going to have to travel 15 miles in order to be able to get the same service. Everybody else gets it at, at five miles. That's a discriminatory practice. So again, when you're going to deliver at alternative sites, look at dispersion. That's part of your analysis and your review. Again, modify your policy uh, and procedure to reflect what you're doing um, or, or how you're going to change it. For example, let's say you have a, um, uh, a process by which people have to wait in line. Um, and you have individuals who, um, uh, by the nature of their disability, um, have difficulty waiting in line. Do you have a procedure in place why, where individuals who have difficulty standing for long periods of time um, could be um, given a, a, an area where they can sit? They have a number that they, that they have, and you call them up by number. And so they're basically holding a place in line for themselves 
um, but they're sitting during that period of time instead of having to stand in that long line. That's a modification of the policy, practice, and procedure that didn't require a physical change, but it requires a modifying of the procedure or the way that you, um, you, you typically would deliver your services. Again, making sure that everything that you do is provided in the most integrated setting appropriate. You wouldn't say, oh, well, all people with disabilities, you're served here, and all people without disabilities, you're served over there. That's not an integrated, and that um, flies in the face of the purpose of the ADA. Some uh, methods of uh, program accessibility, again, um, uh, anything that, um, you know, allow flexibility, um, you know, look at uh, anything that could make it more accessible, you know, will typically work. Um, but again, make sure that you look at that um, integration aspect. Some of the core um, topics or core issues that you, um, you know, might be looking at are one, participation requirements, any initial requirements, any continuing requirements. Are there any discriminatory practices, policies, and procedures that could potentially preclude somebody or limit somebody's participation? Um, what kind of requirements do you have in, fa in place? Again, that must be in person, um, must be able to call a, a voice number, um, must be able to fill out a form, whatever. You must look at um, how uh, those need and may need to be modified because of a disability. Are there tests involved? Um, sometimes uh, uh, there are tests involved in certifying people, especially in licensing and things of that nature, which the state is engaged in um, for licensing of different professions and such of that nature. So all of those things have to be looked at. Um, looking at all of your policies, practices that may discriminate. Again, um, anything that might, uh, you know, an eligibility criteria or anything of that nature. Um, do you do you have separate programs and services? The ADA doesn't say that you can't have separate programs and services for people with disabilities. It just says you can't force people with disabilities to use those separate programs. So you might have a program, uh, a specialized program for people with disabilities. Let's say your DNR offers, Department of Natural Resources offers a variety of specialized programs, you know, for campers with disabilities or for hikers with disabilities, whatever. And that's great. You can have those programs. But then you have people that say, I don't want to provide participate in that program for people with disabilities. I want to participate in the regular program. You still have to make sure that those other programs are accessible for people with disabilities as well. All of our policies, practices around effective communication, you know, this, this includes our documents. This includes our oral communication by telephone. Um, by video, uh, by um, uh, taped recording, um, our automatic systems on our telephones, um, any kind of overhead um, speaker systems or anything that we have uh, or whatever, all of that falls into that effective communication process. Um, and when and where the in-person experience, the telephone experience, the at the meeting experience, the video on the web experience, all of those things all have to be accessible and, and, and meet the issue. Infrastructure, what's our infrastructure, our transportation? Um, what about our roads? What about our, our highways? What about our rest stops? Um, you know, what about all of the transportation um, uh, uh, structures that we own? Um, you know, uh, what about our call systems on the highway for emergency? Um, all of those kinds of things, you know, on toll roads or, or whatever, all of that infrastructure stuff, um, you know, all of our buildings and facilities, et cetera, are, are part of that. Emergency preparedness, again, what, how, and how does the state engage in emergency preparedness? Not only is this an issue for you with the public, but this is also an issue internally for your staff um, and people who might be visitors to your buildings and facilities. So it's the emergency preparedness that you're engaged with in the public and how you interface with local and state, um, I mean, local and county and township uh, entities when an emergency uh, happens in one part of the state. Let's say there's been a tornado or there's been a flood or whatever. How does the state interact with them? But also, how does the state manage its own emergency? Emergency when something has happened in the state, um, something's happened at the Capitol, um, something has happened at one of your state buildings, you know, or, or one of, something has happened in one of your parks or whatever. So emergency preparedness is broad. It, it, it's quite um, encompassing. Again, the outside entities I stressed already, your vendors, your contractors, your grantees. Um, things as simple, and this often gets overlooked, as things that you procure, your purchasing of furniture, equipment, et cetera. Um, you know, what is your procurement process? Um, and and is, is it accessible? Does it have the language that it needs in order to ensure that what we're purchasing is accessible? Are we ensuring and do we have a program in place that looks at, you know, um, do we have a program that's already looking at, um, you know, minorities, 
um, uh, purchasing program or anything of nature? Are we including people with disabilities, uh, minority uh, owned businesses of people with disabilities in that? Um, if we have specialized programs like that, making sure that people with disabilities are included or it's, it's inclusive of those kinds of things. So looking at all of those kinds of programs as well, but looking at what we purchase and what we buy, are we taking into consideration disability and accessibility when we're buying and furniture? Um, do our procurement contracts have the language in them that we need to ensure that what we're purchasing is accessible? If we're going to be buying new telephones, do we have procurement language in there? If we're buying a new telecon system that's going to be implemented across all state buildings, are we? and do we have in, uh, language in there that ensures that it's a, a compatible with a hearing aid, that it's compatible with a, um, uh, a um, assistive listening device, it, that, it, that it is compatible with a TTY uh, telecommunication device? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then did when we take delivery, are we verifying that our contractor or our, um, our vendor has actually provided us with something? I'll tell you, I worked with, and this is not a state entity, this was a private entity, but it was a very, very large entity that had a total remodel. And they purchased all new signs and all of their signs were room numbers because it was a very large entity that had they had over um, uh, 1200 rooms um, that were uh, had room numbers. And so they contracted with a signage company to create all new Braille um, and tactile signs for them. They took delivery of all of their signs, the Braille and tactile signs. And um, when they um, you know, installed them all, and after the fact, they found out that none of them were accessible. Um, the uh, Braille company had not used the correct Braille. Um, and so they had all of these signs that they had installed. They took delivery of them. They paid for them, but they were all incorrect. You, the, you know, it doesn't stop at just having the language. It also stops at making sure that you're holding your contractors and your vendors at, accountable. So somebody needs to be checking those kinds of things because the buck stops with you. If you procured something, you bought something, yeah, you can go back and sue that entity because they gave you something that was incorrect. But the reality is you just installed a whole bunch of inaccessible signs. So you've got liability. So again, th these are very important entities and making sure your policies, practices, and procedures are um, shored up and are in place. Um, applications, um, applications for anything, applications to, um, you know, uh, to get a license um, or ap uh, apply for a benefit or a program or a service. Um, any kind of application that the state has for anything that they do, um, an application to become, um, uh, you know, I want to serve on the board, uh, you know, uh, um, I, I want to be a volunteer board member of one of the uh, governor appointees or something of that nature, and I have a form I have to fill out. Um, you know, I just re uh, received one of those kinds of forms from the state of Illinois, and it's a fillable form, but it wasn't an accessible fillable form. Um, and I had to point that out to them, you know, uh, but th these are the kinds of things that the, these are low hanging fruit. These are things that you should be doing. You're creating these things already. Just make sure you create them accessible, but they should be part of your review as well. So issues to consider when you go through looking at your um, your facilities and things are what's an existing facility. An existing facility is anything that existed prior to the implementation of the ADA, which was not, um, as of January 26, 1991. That was when the uh, ADA standards requirements went into effect. So anything that was constructed before then is an existing facility. Anything constructed after that would be um, a new construction. So that makes a difference when we're looking at barriers. If it's an existing facility, we have a lot more leeway in how we remove the barriers. If it's a new facility built after 1991 and you find a barrier in it, you don't really have an option to provide me a alternative. You need to fix it because you are fully, fully out of compliance from the ground up in that situation. Much more of a critical issue than the existing facility that you tried to make as accessible as possible. Again, what's a program? Um, when it when is a featured element accessible and what are characteristics of an accessible program? These are all things that you need to consider as you look at um, your your programs and we're you're talking about all of those things today. So I've given you um, a um, and if you get my handouts, these are all hyperlinks to a variety of different um, self evaluations that are out there and some resources that are very good um, that show different methods and different ways that they have been done. So the city of Tacoma, again, it's not a state, but it gives you an idea. It's a fairly large community. They developed their entire self evaluation by staff. They did not use any outside um, consultants or anything. The state of Texas Department of Transportation did a self-evaluation and transition plan, plan totally with a contractor. They did not do it internally at all. They gave it away. They paid it to be done. You see the differences. Sacramento did um, a different kind of approach. 
They looked at um, a standard, they compared standard activities, everyday activities versus very unique services. And they did an assessment based on that approach instead of all of their program services and activities. And then New York Parks and Recreation, um, this is the state of New York, um, did a self-evaluation that was a blended where they uh, used an external consultant to help them develop the process. And then it was carried out by the staff with monitoring by the um, consult. So I'm just giving you some options here to look at of, of what different ones look like. Because I, again, I'm one of those people that always is better if I can see what someone else has done and gives me some good ideas and thoughts. So let's start the process of starting it out. So the question that you're going to ask is, does the policy, practice, or procedure screen out or prohibit individuals with disabilities pr from participating in and enjoying the benefits of the program, service, or activity? And in your process, you're going to say either no actions required, I need action to make it compliant, or I recommend action for best practice. It's not that it's not compliant, but we could do better. And this is where I give my soapbox about going above and beyond. So again, the ADA is the minimum requirement. You can always go above and beyond that. So in that process of going through the evaluation and, and deciding how you're gonna document, look at the fact that, you know, yes, we're fully in compliance with this particular policy. Nope, we're not. Um, we need to do something um, to make it compliant. Um, or yes, we're in compliance, but um, we're recommending that we could do it better. So, you know, we're putting it on the table for consideration and discussion. Documents, documents, and documents more. This is probably one of the quagmires that you will have because prior to probably the last 10, 15 years, most of everything that we did was done in paper. And so we've, you know, started to transfer a lot of our stuff over electronically, but we still have this kind of residual problem with that. And that a lot of what we did was we just turned it into PDF documents or we scanned it into PDF and posted it. The problem is a lot of those things are not going to be accessible because unless it was done with the intent of making it accessible and, a, and the structure of the document was such that it could be made accessible, that PDF document or that scanned document is largely probably not going to be accessible to somebody with a screen reader. And then I've got the issue of whether or not somebody can um, enlarge it. Does it magnify? If it's strictly just an image of a document and somebody goes to magnify that and they stretch it, you know what's happened when you've taken an image and you stretch it, it becomes distorted. So that's not going to make it accessible as well. So it really is this evaluation and looking at what are all the documents that we distribute to the public? Are they on the web? If they're on the web, are they accessible? If they're paper format, are they accessible? Do we have accessible formats? If we don't have accessible formats, how do we get to accessible formats? What's the process for getting accessible formats? How many do we always have on hand? Do we not have them on hand, but we have them and we know how we can get them? What's the time frame that which we can get them? How long does it take our Braille provider to create a Braille document for us? We need to know that. That's all part of that policy, practice, and procedure that we need to have in place. So if we have nothing, it's not enough to just say we will distribute um, all of our written materials in an accessible format. That's a policy. Your procedure then is how are you going to go about doing that? It's not enough to just have the policy. You've got to have the procedure and know how to do it. That's part of your analysis. That's part of your review. And it could be different for one department than it is for another department, depending on the kind of documents you have, depending on what you do. Make sure that you, um, as you go through the process, you have interviews with key personnel across the departments to learn and understand what the function of the department is, how do they interface with the public, and what policies may affect how a resident or a visitor receives services um, from them. Um, so if you have staff that are doing this process, hopefully the staff are knowledgeable about the department and stuff, but it does not hurt to make sure that you are interviewing those people who are directly involved with delivering that program service activity and asking them the specifics because they're going to know that program and service activity best. And what we also find in the work that I have done a lot of these, because I've been involved in a lot of self-evaluation transition teams, that there's a lot of stuff that happens that's in somebody's head. It's not written down anywhere. And it's like, well, this is just the way we've always done it. But you can't show me anywhere that it's written down that this is where you have a, is a policy, practice, and procedure. This is where you need to start to get this stuff down because the fact that it's in somebody's head, head and it's the way you've always been doing it is not a defensible part of your self-evaluation. 
Again, your notice to the public. I know you already have this. Make sure that your your agency is aware of it. Make sure that you know know how you're communicating it. No, make, make sure you know how you're. Um, is, is it on the web? Is it in other places, etc.? So the state of Ohio has a notice already. But how is that being communicated? Where? What role does your department? Does your department need to have anything different in your notice to the public, um, like who to contact and things of that nature? This is just a sample of the um, notice under the Americans with Disabilities Act by the Department of Justice. Very, um, it's a sample um, that they give us um, uh, from their uh, toolkit, um, and it goes through all of the different kinds of things and who to contact um, and such related to that to these things. And this is what would be included in a notice to the public. So, you know, employment does not discriminate. Effective communication, you know, we, re, you know, we will accommodate. Um, we will make modifications to policy, practice, and procedure. If you need auxiliary aids and services, this is who you contact. Um, uh, the uh, the ADA does not require them, the uh, state to take any action that would fundamentally alter a program and service. Complaints should be directed to such and such. And, you know, we will not have a surcharge for you asking for your accommodations, et cetera. This is just an example of a notice to the public. Again, designated official, you have a state ADA coordinator, but are you going to have anybody else? Are you going to have somebody in your agency? Is you have a point person? You know, um, are you going to have a centralized process or a decentralized process? If you're a huge agency with multiple sites across the country, uh, across the state that has um, in-person, you know, regular contact, you may think of needing somebody as a point person at each location. How are you managing that? That all needs to be part of um, your uh, self-evaluation process. What's your grievance procedure look like? Is it different for different agencies? Um, is it one central one? How are how is it handled? What are the time frames? How do people with disabilities know about it? Um, what's the appeal process? All of that is part of again the appeal process and could be different from department to department, issue to issue. How are we going to get input from people with disabilities? Who are we going to contact? What disability organizations do we have relationships with? Who do we trust? Um, are we going to make sure that they are cross disability? Is this something that we're going to do once or is this going to be an ongoing process? You know, maybe our agency has such significant impact or contact with the public that we're going to have a advisory committee of people that we're going to have as an ongoing basis. Um, or this is just going to be a one time deal just for this process. Um, you know, do we already have existing structures in place that we could tap into? Some of our um, uh, human services agencies and stuff of that nature already have advisory boards and such um, as part of them already. Maybe we can tap into them. Our vocational rehabilitation agency has an advisory board. Maybe we can tap in, into them. So, you know, really looking at that structure you already have or maybe you need to create a new structure for getting that. But it's really critically important that this input for people with disabilities occurs. This is really a, a tough one. This is where you need to be reflective internally um, and look at ourselves. Look inside and say, do we have people with disabilities represented in our workforce? How do we know we have people with disabilities in our workforce? What processes do we have in place? What do we have that supports people with disabilities to work here? And what do our employment practices look like? Are people with disabilities represented in leadership positions? What does that look like? How do we recruit and ensure that, the, that there's diversity in that recruitment process? Um, you know, um, that are people, uh, you know, are being uh, promoted and stuff into leadership opportunities. And then what about the um, process of boards, commissions, councils and stuff at the state level? How are we ensuring that people with disabilities, not from a token, not being, you know, uh, that, oh yeah, well, we gotta make sure we got our one person with a disability, one person that's black, one person that's Asian, one person that's transgender, whatever. No, that's not counting off. I'm not talking about tokenism here. I'm saying about what are we doing to make sure that people with disabilities are represented across the board? When you talk about DEIA, and I add that A, it's disability, you know, it, it's, it's diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And so making sure that accessibility is a key part of that and that people with disabilities are represented in your leadership. Um, that's part of your evaluation as well. Again, alternate formats. What information do we have available? How do people get a hold of it? What's the process? Do people tra train to, um, you know, at intake, you know, to take those kinds of requests? I will tell you, this is one of the lowest hanging fruit in your issue. And one of the um, biggest denominators for uh, violations under the ADA is the fact that we have not trained our frontline staff how to respond to requests. Um, you know, often we hear is that I called and I said I, I requested it and they said, well, we don't offer that. 
Well, that was because somebody at the front desk who answers the phone wasn't trained. Yes, you do offer it, um, but they don't know how to do it. They've never been uh, asked. They're new. They may could have been there forever, but nobody's ever asked before, so they didn't know that you did it. There's a lot of different excuses that can people give, but that person is your lowest denominator. That person is your most and your biggest liability in your organization. So it's really critically important that you look at what are our processes, how do we communicate those processes, who needs to know about those processes, um, and, and all of those uh, details associated with who's paying for it, what's the time frame, et cetera. What about anything where, and everything, uh, any forms and stuff where we ask about disability, um, you know, any of our registration forms, any kind of our um, forms for signing up uh, for anything, do we ask questions? Are they appropriate? What's the language that we're using? Are we assuring that we're not asking specifically disability related questions? Um, you know, um, any medical forms and things of that nature, what do we have? Are waivers consistent with safety assessments? You know, are we requiring only people who identify as having a disability to do waivers? Everybody has to do waivers. What's the language on the waivers? Um, you know, and are they consistent with business necessity? Sometimes we see entities hide behind these kinds of things for liability. And anyone who talks to an attorney will tell you that, you know, waivers, you know, can always be found uh, low pools and stuff through them. But what's critical from the ADA's perspective is making sure that people with disabilities aren't treated differently in this waiver process than people without a disability. Everybody is a what if. So really be critical in your thinking about what kind of disability inquiry do we make in any of our processes and do we need to make that disability um, uh, inquiry? Um, is it absolutely necessary or has it just been something that's languishing as a previous practice and we've carried it forward or someone has said that, you know, for risk management purposes, we need this information. Question yourself, ask yourself, is this truly and can I make an argument it's necessary for business necessity? What about eligibility criteria? Do all of our programs have um, eligibility criteria? Is it communicated clearly? Is there anything that's um, that would be potentially discriminatory? For example, the uh, example I'd used earlier about do we have language that says things like sound minded body? Do we have language for eligibility that says you must be able to walk, you must be able to hear, you must be able to see? Those all may need to be relooked at and said, no, do I actually be, need to be able to walk or do I just need to be able to get from point A to B? Um, or do I actually need to be able to hear or does it need to mean that I just have to be able to process information that's been delivered orally? Or do I have to be able to see? Or is it that I have to be able to be able to um, uh, read uh, or um, comprehend information that has been presented visually? You know, so I really need to look at that for my eligibility criteria and the kind of language that we're using to make sure that we're not discriminating, we're not screening out people. And anything that we do have that does have those kind of specific qualifiers on it, is it, ask ourselves the question, is it consistent with business necessity? What's our service animal policies? Are they consistent across the board? Do we have different policies in different situations? Do we have certain circumstances and situations where service animals would not be allowed? What's our rationale for that? Um, how are we training our staff related to that? How are we responding to um, people who are bringing emotional support animals in and versus service animals? All of those kinds of things. Do our staff know and do we have in the policy? What are their permissible questions? Do we have language that says something that the dog has to be under the control of the handler versus the dog must be on a leash or must be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, have a vest on or something? Because those are not requirements under the law. So how do we write that policy? Then what's the procedure for validating or verifying that is a service animal versus an emotional support animal or a pet? And again, it could be different in different situations and circumstances. I mentioned earlier the other power drill mobility devices. We have to look at any policies where we look at restricting access um, uh, by, to people that might be using motorized uh, vehicles or devices of any type and looking at whether or not language is consistent with the ADA so that it would not preclude or screen out somebody who's using a Segway for accessibility. A lot of our vets since Iraq and Iran have um, uh, been outfitted with segways for amputees and things of that nature, the VA gives them out um, uh, as a regular basis for people. They're much more efficient than wheelchairs. They must allow for a lot more flexibility and such of that nature, um, but they're often uh, by policy precluded from using trails and things of that nature. We have to modify those policies, practices, and procedures unless we can make an argument that it's a direct threat um, or a fundamental alteration 
Um, so for example, there might be some trails in your Department of Natural Resources where there might be rationale for restriction of that type. There might be certain venues or events with high crowd um, that might be an issue because segways can go quite fast so that you might have to have some kind of a policy that restricts speed or something of that nature. But you have to look at these things. Uh, you know, somebody might be using a uh, battery powered um, uh, um, golf cart um, instead of a wheelchair. And, you know, that you, you say, you know, oh, you can't bring golf carts in here. Well, you have to look at those because there are golf carts that are, you know, not any bigger than a large um, you know, powered wheelchair that somebody's using that has a ventilator. Um, so again, you have to look at your policies, practices, and procedures and make sure that they're consistent and that you have language in there that allows for and affords the flexibility necessary to be able to make this kind of an assessment of whether or not it's reasonable to allow those kinds of devices um, and not preclude them because of disability. What kind of modifications do we need to make um, of policies? Um, you know, uh, what 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 is... Uh, um, what's realistic? Is it a centralized process? Who makes the decision? Um, uh, you know, uh, who has the authority to make a modification of a policy? How do we document that? We would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you have some kind of a logging process for um, uh, requests for accommodations so that you log what the accommodation request was, how was it responded to, et cetera, because it's one of those kinds of things that's never a problem till it's a problem. But if you don't have a process, you, you, you know, this is part of your evaluation. Do we have a process? What happens when an accommodation request is made? Who addresses it? How did they address it? How is it documented, et cetera? All of those kinds of things. Do we do a, a post-program evaluation to assess the quality of the accommodation that was provided? Do we ask questions on our evaluations that we send out to participants in our programs? And do we include questions about accommodations so that we get a sense of whether we're doing good or bad? Again, these are part of our assessment. Uh, I've already stressed enough the issue of contracts of par uh, with uh, partners and partnerships, et cetera. You know, what are we requiring of them? What language do we have of them? What are we holding them accountable? Are the roles and expectations clearly defined? Because many of our partners and our contractors are in their own right also covered under the ADA, typically under Title III, for-profit, non-profit, or whatever. But because they are recipients of your funds and they're providing a service on your behalf, they also have, and you have responsibilities to ensure that they're meeting your obligations under Title II in addition to their own obligations under Title III. Safety. How do you assess safety? Uh, how is it done? What? How is the safety uh, coordinator or risk manager involved if there is one and there typically is? How is that assessment documented? So when you're saying and, and denying something for somebody saying that, that, you know, we can't accommodate this because it's unsafe, how is that analysis being made? How is that, um, you know, being documented, et cetera? Um, and, you know, uh, and when does that need to be pulled into the process? You know, that is all, again, part of your evaluation and the questions that you are asking in the assessment. And then what, what happens when we say no? And what happens when we have to say no? Sometimes you have to say no, but you want to understand in the process who is involved in that determination. And if you're denying somebody's request, how are you documenting it? And how are you explaining the assessment of what you went through to make the decision of no and what the rationale was? Again, it's not a problem till it's a problem. When you get a complaint file and you have to resurrect what you did and the steps that were taken, you really want to make sure that you've got a sound practice in place. And again, part of your assessment, do we have a practice in place for both accepting an accommodation and denying an accommodation? So granting it as well as denying it. We want to have a um, documentation process. Again, part of your assessment. Do we or don't we? If we don't, we need to have that in place. What is it going to look like? And then it gets down to the action plan. Your final part is what are the policies and procedures that we've now identified that need to be modified? What personnel or departments is responsible for that modification? And then what costs, if any, are associated with that modification that needs to be made? Sometimes there will be no cost. It's strictly the implementation of a policy. Um, or the development of a policy and implementation. Other times it may be a cost because there needs to be an architectural change. There needs to be purchasing of a certain piece of equipment, a hiring of a special consultant or whatever to be able to rectify um, or implement um, the appropriate accommodations. All that 
as part of your action plan. This is just, again, in my free session, I gave a screenshot of an a, a option of an action plan. This is a, the, the same document again, um, uh, it reiterated, and there are, these are hyperlinked, so you can get them. They are fillable forms. You can modify them. Um, they are available in PDF, um, uh, uh, fillable PDF, uh, Word, and um, plain text. Um, so again, they are all hyperlinked in my presentation uh, that you should get if you want it after the session. And then other res resources I refer you to is the Title II Technical Assistance Guide from the Department of Justice, which again discusses in more detail the self-evaluation process and obligation. And then also, as I referred to my last session, the Department of Justice Project Civic Access and their ADA Toolkit is available on their website. It's always good to look at this because it gives you an idea of what other entities have had to go through who did not do a self-evaluation and got caught in the Project Civic Access litigation process or the settlement agreement process, but also the toolkit gives you those tools that you may need or could use or modify to do your evaluation. A lot of checklists, um, uh, a lot of uh, sample documents available in that toolkit for you to look at, potentially um, plagiarize from, use, they're, they're open to, uh, to that being done. So I am going to go ahead and open it up for questions at this time, um, if there are any. Thank you, Robin. We do have, uh, n well, not a question, but a comment. Okay. Great. All of the items Robin has expertly expertly presented today for consideration as part of an agency self-evaluation might feel scary and overwhelming, but <laughs> don't let it. Remember that we have a wealth of knowledge, skills, and experience within Team Ohio from the Office of Disability Inclusion with James, Chelsea, to OOD, DODD, and on and on. You don't have to undergo the process alone. Very insightful information, Robin. A big thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know I, I, I do this and I, I, I can the one disadvantage of doing things virtually is I don't get to see people's eyes and I don't get to see their faces when I talk about some of this stuff when it's in um, person, um, then I often, you know, am able to react to the person who's rolling their eyes or the person who's got a stunned face um, look on their face or the person who's suddenly kind of uh, retreating in their seat because they're becoming overwhelmed um, with the, the prospect of this. It is a big task. It's a huge task, um, but it is important. And that's why, you know, having a team and having and, and, and really thinking it through and deciding what's realistic for you. You know, um, I have seen organizations and entities um, get themselves going down a rabbit hole by going so um, uh, uh minute um, in the process that they get buried in the detail. I would really caution you against that and really talk through as an organization and, and your teams as to what's going to work for us. What do we need and, and what do we need to move forward? And what do we feel comfortable and confident on that we can defend ourselves um, in regards to our accessibility? And, you know, um, what, what are the uh, key most important things for us to look at? And look at, at your past. Look at where you've had problems in the past. Start with those things. Start where you've already had complaints filed and things of that nature, because those are the areas that have already been uncovered as being problems. So those are going to be the easiest ones for you to fix um, and, and are already obvious. And then start doing the other things, um, you know, gradually uh, as you go down the, the, down, the, um, down the line. That's all I can really recommend. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Robin. And James Clinksdale also shares, in fact, Team Ohio, the Disability Inclusion Program, will lead this enterprise effort with more training and Ohio-specific resources. We've got your back. Great, good. And then always know that you are uh, welcome and free to contact our office. Um, we're a resource. You don't even have to tell us you're from the state of Ohio. We don't care. Um, you, uh, you can talk through a scenario with us or whatever. Ask us for resources. Ask us if there's something we're aware of, a sample of something or whatever. We're more than happy to share and um, uh, engage with you in that process. But if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank you, Robin, and thanks to everyone for attending. We hope you enjoyed this session. If you have any additional questions or would like to request slides or presentation materials, please email the Office of Disability Inclusion at odi at das.ohio.gov. We'd also like to invite you to share feedback on this session using the link provided in the chat. 
Thank you again for supporting Ohio's commitment to disability inclusion and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Take care.